Thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, first of all, I want to thank Uno and Sushmita for the invitation. And I'm very happy that after the postponement, uh, postponements of these uh, activity due to the pandemic, we can be here. It's really a pleasure. So I will, in my lectures, will focus on the geometry of vortices, by which I mean the geometry of moduli spaces of vortices on compact Riemann surfaces. And, uh, but to, uh, to make, uh, this is not uh, working in focus, <laughs> sorry. So to, let's see if this works. Yeah, so to make Martin happy, I will start with uh, actually talking about vortices on R2. That's the, uh, the abelian Higgs model uh, on R2. And uh, so the, uh, Nuno has already introduced us to, to vortices. So there was some repetition of what, uh, <clears throat> of what he said, but I hope this repetition is, I find always useful. And so we consider a U1 connection on uh, a complex line bundle over R2, necessarily trivial, right? So this R2 plus C, that's called the potential, right? And then the Higgs field, which is a, a smooth function, smooth complex function, and so one has the young mills Higgs functional, which is obtained by integrating the, uh, is the L2 norm of the curvature, the L2 norm of the covariant derivative acting on phi, and then this uh, quartic term in, in, in phi. Now, uh, and lambda here is a real parameter. Right? So in order for this, for this uh, to be uh, defined, uh, in order to have finite energy, we want this to be finite, so obviously we need some, uh, some conditions as X tends to infinity, right? We are on R2. And so first condition is that the norm of phi has to go to one, right? Then the covariant derivative has to tend to zero, right? And the, the curvature as we tend to infinity has to tend to zero in order to have this integral uh, to be defined. And so then this condition here, in particular means that if you take phi and you divide by the normal phi, this defines a map from a large circle in R2 to the unit circle. And so there is a degree of this map, and this is what we call the vortex charge or vortex number. You can also uh, see that number appearing uh, uh, from the fact that because the, the curvature uh, has this condition, now you can integrate the curvature, or if you prefer the, the, the curvature, the connection compactifies to a line bundle over the sphere, right? still with Martin, okay? And on the sphere, so this defines a chain class, and that is another way of recovering this vortex number. So, uh, so th this functional first appeared in the Ginsburg-Landau model, uh, for superconductivity uh, in 1950. And this is a, a, a macroscopic theory. I will just matter a few words about the, the physical, uh, the appearance of these things in physics, but I uh, know very little about uh, really the physics. So you have physicists here that can explain all of this, but just to mention that there is also, uh, so it is one of the first instances of uh, gauge symmetry breaking. And so this is an analogous to the gauge uh, symmetry breaking that are uh, described by Higgs and others in the context of electroweak interaction. And, uh, but this model, so there was the Bardeen Cooper, uh, Riffa, uh, Riffa, uh, gave a microscopic theory where superconductivity is sort of due to the condensation of, of Cooper pairs, that uh, electrons organizing Cooper pairs and the, uh, the uh, the norm, the square of the norm of phi, somehow gives a, an idea of the density of these Cooper pairs, right? And actually this uh, model that they gave uh, won him in 72 uh, a Nobel Prize, right? And so it was a model that explained many things, but uh, so, and there was a parameter lambda that you saw before, and this parameter seemed to separate, you know, according to whether lambda was less than one superconductors of type one or lambda was, bigger than one, superconductors of type two, but something interesting occurs 
mathematically also at the, uh, where lambda is equal to one in the, in the functional, remember, so let's switch us back to the functional, it is lambda, this is lambda, when lambda is equal to one, there is uh, something very nice, and this that you can uh, actually, let me just, uh, you can rewrite that functional. Again, we are going to identify R2 with a complex plane, and using uh, complex coordinates, we can express the covariant derivative in terms of the one zero part and the zero one part. This is what, what uh, already used by Nuno. And so uh, assume that D is positive, you can take the negative one by considering the complex conjugate structure of C, right? And, uh, and so then you can do integration by parts of the functional. And this is, uh, and you obtained, you, you look at this and you realize that by doing integration by parts, the Yamni Hiss function is bounded by this topological number, the vortex number times two pi. And then a minima is acquired exactly when this is zero and this is zero. And these are exactly the vortex equations. So minimum and the minimum value is exactly two pi d satisfied when this is equal to zero and this is equal to zero. And here is uh, the star is a Hodge operator, star operator that we already saw appearing in uh, Nuno's talk. And this is the, it is a two form that it makes sense to confront, you know, with the curvature. So again, I wasn't given this mission, but I will take it just that I, to write something in coordinates because I'm not going to write anything in coordinates after that, is that you can, actually write very concretely these equations uh, if you choose real coordinates x1 and x2 on r2 and then the connection one form is given by uh, this function times dx1 and a2 dx2 and phi being a complex function on r2 it has two parts the real and imaginary part and so the curvature is given by this function here it's a two form Right, but the and this two function is exactly given by by this expression derivating the the, uh, the terms of the connection one form. So you can very explicitly write the equations now if you choose, as I said, you choose complex coordinates, and then set is x1 plus ix2, then you can express the connection as a one form, you can express it in the in the basis of dz and dz bar, right? And uh, as alpha and alpha bar, where alpha is uh, concretely given by this combination of a1 and a2, and the d bar operator is just the you know familiar uh, uh, Cauchy-Riemann operator in terms of uh, d1 and, and d2, and so then the vortex equations are just simply written in this way. So it's just another, it's just you know a function, another function, and then this derivative here. Okay, I am just commenting here, as I said before, that the vortex number can be obtained, as I said before, from the curvature, um, because of the, uh, the, the conditions of the curvature as x tend to, to infinity, or as I said, the fact that the line bundle compactifies to a line bundle of the sphere, and this is really the first chunk class of the line bundle. Okay, so these are the equations that, um, so, uh, so relevant thing is these equations are invariant under gauge transformations and the moduli space of solutions, what we call vortices, is defined as a quotient, the space of all solutions modulo gauge equivalents. And so in this, uh, the mathematical study of this equation, though these equations have been around for a long time, the mathematical study was uh, beautifully done by Taubes in his thesis, where he proves the following existence theorem. He says, if given d points uh, in R2, maybe with multiplicities, there exists a solution to the vortex equations unique up to gauge equivalence, so that the Higgs field vanishes exactly at those points. And so that the Young Mills Higgs functional is precisely the value two pi the degree, the vortex number. So what this is saying, is that the moduli space of vortices in this on R2, the billion vortices, 
is given by is the space of an order d tuples, so the symmetric uh, product of the complex plane. <coughs> and this can be thought, this, this symmetric product, um, as the space of zeros of a monic polynomial, right? This polynomial. And when you look at this polynomial, this polynomial is totally described by the coefficients. So this is a nice way of seeing that actually the moduli space is just the vector space CT, C to the D. So this symmetric product is really just this vector space C to the D, and um, uh, which are viewed as the coefficients of the polynomial that has the zeros, the zeros here. So this is what Tau proved, and this is very uh, nicely described in a book by Jaffe and Taubes on vortices and monopoles. Uh, monopoles being good friends of vortices in R3, in this particular case. Okay, so this is my, uh, all I will say about the non-compact situation, R2 and coordinates. And now I want to uh, consider the setup that was already uh, mentioned this morning by considering, so vortices on a compact Riemann surface. So my notation will not coincide necessarily and my <clears throat> um, conventions with those of Luna, but the whole theory is, I mean, everything is, is the same. So X is a compact Riemann surface and we fixed uh, uh, a Kähler form, all the, you know, like Kähler metric, right? Um, all the metrics on a compact Riemann surface are Kähler. So you choose the Kähler form. And we will, in order to avoid two pi's and things like this, we will conveniently normalize the volume of the surface uh, uh, as we will uh, conveniently, uh, we will see what is the convenient thing after as, 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 as we progress. So then we have a, a line bundle, a smooth complex line bundle over X. And H is a Hermitian line metric on L. So on each fiber, I do have a Hermitian metric. I am not, uh, so this, the, the pair LH is what Luno called L, L bar today, right? And now tau is a real parameter. So um, this uh, real parameter now, so we have the vortex equations for this value of this parameter. And these are equations for a unitary connection on the Hermitian line bundle LH, and phi is a smooth section of L, right? So, uh, so here, uh, one uh, the different of, uh, convention is that for me, the curvature, which is a two form that takes values not in R, but in I times R, that's what is natural. But uh, the, uh, uh, that's why, uh, uh, yeah. So this lambda FA means contraction with the Kähler form. And so this is a function that again takes values in IR, right? And uh, the norm with respect the, of phi with respect to H is just a function, right? Uh, on X with values in R. So in order to go back to R, I multiply here by I, right? By square root of minus one. And so these are the tau vortex equations on a line bundle on a compact human surface. And so, like in the case of R2, solutions to the vortex equations are also minima of a certain Jan Mills Higgs functional, which is very much the same as uh, I wrote before, except now the, um, the, the functional incorporates the, um, the uh, 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 value tau. You, you may argue that there was also in the R2 a parameter lambda, but the story of having this minima happen only for a value, for one fixed value of lambda that was one, right? Well, here, the story that I will describe happens for any, any value, is an arbitrary value of tau. And so um, perhaps, um, so uh, let me just say that we can write the yang mills x functional depending on tau, of a connection and phi as the L2 norm of the curvature, then plus the L2 norm of the covariant derivative of phi, and then plus, okay, don't worry too much about coefficients here. Uh, 
I put there one fourth, but I want to, you notice actually that the one half that appeared in the previous case has disappeared. I don't, uh, you know, just to avoid fractions and things like this, you can just modify the functional and just, uh, you can write one half and then you have the, the L2 norm of uh, phi square minus tau, right? Yeah, so this is, so this is the young mill Higgs functional for uh, any value of tau. And now, um, morally integration by parts, but here is not integration by parts, it's really the Kähler identities. You can actually write, rewrite this functional as in fact the L2 norm of precisely the, the, the equation there, the one of the, the second equation, And there's then the L2 norm of k bar of phi plus two pi d, d is the degree and times tau, right? So uh, similar to the, uh, to the uh, Bogomolny trick of writing by parts, you can see that indeed the solutions to the vortex equations are minima for this functional and the minimum value, the minimum value is exactly this thing in here, okay? Now, the gauge group acts, uh, which you can view it in this particular uh, abelian situation as just functions on the surface to U1, the circle, and acts on the space of pairs, uh, just on the covariant derivative, just by uh, conjugating the covariant derivative, and on the Higgs field by just multiplying the Higgs field by this function G. And this uh, action, preserves the vortex equations. And I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Do I have to say okay or something? I actually cannot say okay, because I don't have control of that. But, uh, I don't want to touch it. <laughs> So the, the gauge group acts on the space of pairs and this action, you can check how the curvature behaves under the curvature behaves and so on, preserves the young Mills uh, Higgs uh, functional, you see the young Mills Higgs functional is invariant Thank you. And this, under this uh, action, and in particular, the equations are left invariant. So the moduli space of vortices is the space of solutions mod, uh, modulo this uh, action by uh, unitary gauge transformations. Now, as I said before, uh, integrating now, okay. Uh, now, the, if you integrate the second equation, uh, then using Chen Wei theory, right? You can see, uh, this was already mentioned in Uno's uh, talk, that this relates to the first Chen class of the degree of L. And then uh, you here have the norm of, the L2 norm of phi and tau times the volume of X, right? And so then this, um, now here is where it's convenient to normalize the volume, say, but two pi, so that this implies that in order to have solutions at all, the degree of L has to be a smaller uh, or equal than tau, right? And so um, this is exactly the inequality that Nuno was mentioning, except that I am normalizing my volume so that I can avoid two pi's and things like this. Right? And so if the degree of L is tau, then necessarily phi, because this is non-negative, has to be zero. And in that situation, uh, solutions exist simply by Hodge theory. This is just the Laplacian, by just solving the Laplacian. I'm hearing myself just with a few minutes later. Um, and, um, <laughs> okay. Um, 
so, so just the existence of solutions is really, as I say, is just the, is, uh, the existence of solutions to the Laplace, uh, Laplacian equation, the Laplace equation, and that's a linear PD, right? While the case of phi different than zero is really a non-linear, a non-linear PD. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, we'll understand somehow, I hope that we can already uh, understand the non-linear nature of this equation later on uh, from the fact that they come from a, uh, from a theory in four dimensions, right? But I mean, the non-linearity is, is obvious, right? From the equations, but the, the reason why uh, somehow it's inherited by a non-abelian gauge theory, as we will see. Okay, so the theorem in this situation says that if you take an effective divisor, <coughs> sorry, which is um, an element in the symmetric product of the Riemann surface, uh, this is what we call an effective divisor, then there exists a unique solution to the vortex equation, equations modulo gauge equivalence with phi different than zero, and uh, so that phi vanishes precisely at those points with multiplicity, if there is multiplicity in this, uh, in this divisor, if and only if the degree of L is smaller than tau. And so this is a basic theorem for uh, non-abelian vortices. And uh, there are several proofs of this, um, quite independent proofs actually would reflect the interest that there was on this and different points of view. And actually the first proof was given by Noguchi in 87, uh, he didn't consider a parameter tau, where he put it equal to one, but it's exactly, you know, the proof works. And he uses this usual, you know, tools in nonlinear analysis that, um, that um, one has not so much about the geometry, but just, um, and then Steve Bradlow gave a proof by reducing the equations to some other equations that were well studied in geometry, the Kass and Warner equation in Riemannian geometry. I will mention uh, something more about uh, uh, Steve's uh, proof of uh, using the Kass and Warner later on. And I gave two different proofs of this uh, theorem. One that uses somehow based on the symplectic geometry on moment maps and so on. And another one that precisely brings this, what I just said about the fact that these equations are dimensional reduction of uh, Hermitian young loss equations, non-abelian Hermitian young loss equations. And so I will uh, explain first a little bit about the symplectic geometry that has already been alluded uh, today. So, um, Remember, so before I do that, remember that, uh, uh, okay, if we have uh, a symplectic manifold, and a group uh, G acting on it symplectically, so symplectic action that is preserving uh, preserving the, the symplectic form under some conditions that uh, were uh, sort of mentioned this morning by Nuno, we have the moment map from the manifold to the dual of the Lie algebra that you can identify with the, using a metric on the Lie algebra with the Lie algebra itself if you want. And then uh, you can construct symplectic quotients by taking the pre-image of some coadjoint orbit, or if you want, actually, you can take some central element or something, something that is uh, in the center of G and so is left invariant on the gauge group. And so, because there is a G equivariant, so this is G equivariant map, the equivariant, is a, so it's a moment map. Yeah? The moment maps are good to construct symplectic manifolds uh, out of uh, uh, other symplectic manifolds when you have a symplectic action. And so this fundamental fact, this is the symplectic quotient that um, is the, the Marsden 
Einstein uh, quotient or the symplectic quotient. In fact, if, um, if M is actually a Kähler manifold and the action of G is also by isometries, so it preserves the, the metric, right? Then uh, under some conditions, you can endow this with a, with a Kähler metric, right? And just um, um, so this, in this context, this for a symplectic manifold, this is another symplectic manifold. And the uh, real dimension of this is actually, uh, you know, the dimension of M minus twice the dimension of the group. Uh, so by considering this thing, you're cutting the dimensions in the dimension of G, and now by quotienting by G, you have are subtracting again another dimension of G. Uh, and so this is the dimension of this manifold. And as I say, if this is a Kähler manifold and the group acts by isometries and so on, then this can be endowed with a, with a Kähler. Uh, so it's a Kähler, uh, Kähler manifold. In fact, something actually that is recurrent in the kind of correspondences that uh, uh, we were talking about is um, a, an important uh, phenomenon that happens relating this symplectic quotient with in the situation say where your Kähler manifold M is actually an algebraic, uh, algebraic manifold and a projective manifold, perhaps, then you can have this uh, to be uh, just the GAT quotient by some action that will depend on C and principle, the complexification of G. G, say, is a compact group here, right? And so this is a, a kind of um, important, um, important um, isomorphism that is the Kempfness theory and so on, that is an inspiration for the kind of correspondences that we will have because, in fact, the kind of symplectic manifolds that we will be starting with are not finite dimensional but infinite dimensional. And uh, however, this construction of the symplectic quotient right, makes perfect sense when M is an infinite dimensional manifold and G is an infinite dimensional Lie group. In order to make sense of these things, you have, I don't know if you have experience with infinite dimensional manifolds, but in the same way as ordinary manifolds are modeled on opens of Rn, you have to model this on Banach manifolds and, and, uh, and, on, uh, and then on Banach spaces. And so then you can endow and make sense of, uh, of this, of the theory of infinite dimensions. And this construction of symplectic quotient is absolutely rigorous. It makes perfect sense. And as we will see, and this is an instance of that, even though the, the symplectic manifold you start with is infinite dimensional and the group is infinite dimensional, sometimes like in the case we will see the quotient, symplectic quotient is finite dimensional, right? The one thing that is not there in infinite dimensions is to have a universal uh, sort of proof of this. Uh, we can make sense of what do we mean by this in infinite dimensions as well. And this will lead some, some notion of stability, but in infinite dimensions, there is not a theorem by Kempness that will tell us that the symplectic quotient is always isomorphic to this kind of quotient. And so we need every time to prove this in a one by one situation. So I have been uh, going ahead of myself. Let me tell you now, what is the symplectic manifold? So consider the space of unitary connections on the Hermitian line bundle, and then the space of sections. This is where the connection is, and the Higgs field is in here. And so these two spaces are infinite dimensional, actually Kähler manifolds, right? And I say, as I said, you can make this rigorous in a precise sense of infinite dimensional uh, manifolds, uh, models on some Banach spaces and so on, but this will just be a formal kind of description. And so the gauge group acts symplectically on this, 
on this, uh, uh, we can write actually what is the symplectic form here. Uh, I have been a bit lazy and I haven't written it, but uh, G acts symplectically on this, and there is a moment map. <coughs> and the moment map going under this identification here, identifying the Lie algebra, the dual with the Lie algebra, so this is the Lie algebra of the gauge group, which is just functions on uh, real functions on X, right? Then is precisely given by the contraction of the curvature uh, times the square root of minus one. And this is the part concerning the action of the gauge group on this space. And then this is the moment map for the action of the gauge group on the space of sections. Okay, so now on, uh, and in, as I said, this is a, actually uh, an infinite dimensional Kähler manifold. And here we are going to consider a sub variety of this infinite dimensional, um, infinite dimensional Kähler manifold, which is given by the pairs, a phi so that phi is holomorphic with respect to the to DA bar, to the, to the um, operator, the zero one part defined by the covariant derivative. And okay, there are subtleties here in the sense that this may have, well, this is basically, you know, this is an affine space and this is a linear space. There's no mystery about, there's a smooth manifold that you can make sense of it. This may have singularities and so on, but we will not discuss these things. And, uh, and so then we can restrict the moment map to this sub variety. And so the moduli space of vortices coincides exactly with the Kähler quotient, uh, this Kähler quotient, where we are taking this tau. I mean, Nuno was incorporating somehow the tau in the moment map. You can do that. Or alternatively, you can define the moment map and then take some kind of central value if you want or some quadrant orbit. I chose to do that, to have a, just a, a fixed moment map and then take different values, different uh, values of uh, central elements to define different Kähler quotients, right? And so the, uh, this, as I said, is a very interesting situation in which this is a finite dimensional space, even though this is infinite dimensional and G is infinite dimensional and this, is simply a consequence of the fact that the linearization of the equations and the action of the gauge group defines an elliptic complex. Yeah, and so there is an index there. And so this is the reason why you have a finite dimensional space, this ellipticity of this complex. Now, we can identify the space of connections, in fact, with a space of holomorphic structures on L. Uh, this is what is called sometimes a churn correspondence, which is basically, if you give me a covariant derivative, I can take the zero one part. This is the space of Dolbo operators on the line bundle or equivalently holomorphic structures. We think, you know, you may think of holomorphic structures on a line bundle as having trans transition functions that are holomorphic, but here we just, uh, an equivalent way of thinking of this that is uh, more um, near uh, gauge theory is to think of holomorphic structures as given by this kind of operator, a Dolbo operator satisfying that acts on the space of sections of L satisfying some Leibniz rule, similar to what a covariant derivative satisfies, satisfies the, the, the Leibniz rule. Right? And so I, I should say there is a correspondence here. I'm saying the easy part, which is if you give me yeah, no, uh, so if you give me a, a uh, covariant derivative or a connection, I can just take the zero one part. If you give me the zero one part, by unitarity, I can recover the one zero part. And this is why this is a one-to-one -one correspondence actually. And so the, the complex gauge group, which is just, you can in this situation, view it as functions on X taken by C star. This is the complexification of the unitary gauge group acts on the space C by exactly conjugating the Dolbo operator. And this action preserves in, well, I haven't said, actually I should say that this acts on the space of uh, sections right, of L, just by multiplication, right? it's not here. And that action preserves 
the sub variety M that I was considering. Because there is a cancellation between this G minus one here and the G multiplying phi. So if D bar of phi was zero, then uh, G uh, acting on D bar acting on G acting on phi is also, also zero. So that preserves M. And so the theorem, the existence theorem is simply saying that uh, we do have a one-to-one -one correspondence between this symplectic quotient and this quotient that you can see that quotient really uh, uh, you can immediately see is described by the symmetric product of X because this quotient is given by equivalence classes of a holomorphic line bundle and the section and the place where the section vanishes is actually invariant under the action of the complex gauge group. So really this quotient uh, is the, as, as Uno was saying, this is the one you can see easily, in this case, very easily, right? Is just the symmetric product of the Riemann surface. And this is even only if the degree of L is less than tau. And uh, as I mentioned before, this is an infinite dimensional version of this kind of uh, the finite dimensional uh, Kempf-Ness uh, theorem that is a rigorous theorem in finite dimensions. But here, as I said, one has to prove it. And this is exactly the existence theorem that we have been describing before. Now, I said there was one proof uh, using this symplectic moment map picture and another one that I gave using dimensional reduction you see, I don't want to, you to get the impression that it's just, okay, easy and so on. There is some analysis that you have to do always. And in this particular case, basically the analysis you have to do is you take an effective, uh, an effective uh, divisor, some element in this symmetric product, and you represent it by a pair in N. And you take the whole complex orbit. You have to prove that there exists an equivalent element that satisfies the vortex equations. And so to do that, you have to enter into the world of geometric analysis where you have to consider, um, you know, you have to find the appropriate bounds. You have to complete the space of connections that, you know, there was just smooth connections and smooth Higgs fields and so on to, you know, some Sobolev spaces like L12 Sobolev spaces. And then you have to consider the gauge group completing it into L22, uh, so Sobolev spaces also. And you have to find bounds for the curvature. And a crucial ingredient, I, I, will, I, won't, I won't say much about it. This is the details of this direct proof is in one of the papers I wrote on this. But a key ingredient there is uh, Uhlenbeck weak compactness theorem that was already used in uh, Donaldson's proof of the theorem of Nelson and Sechadri. And the fact that actually considering gauge transformations that are in the Sobolev space L22, L22 is contained in C0. So you don't change the topology of the line bundle. And so this is important. So lots of bounds. And so you start with a convergent, you have as I said, you take a representative in N, so this is a, a holomorphic structure and a, a, or a connection, if you want, an X field whose zeros are in here. You take the whole orbit here, the whole orbit on the GC, and you take a minimizing sequence. And you have to prove that that minimizing sequence converges, right? And these bounds are important in doing that. So that's how you prove so, uh, this <laughs> work that you have to do doing uh, some analysis. But um, so now I want us to mention that uh, the L2 metric that was alluded this morning is exactly the, the scalar metric, metric that is inherited by this mechanism of uh, the Kähler quotient, right? And I won't discuss that at all, but this is exactly the subject that will be discussed, you know, by Martin and and, and, and by Nuno is exactly the study of the beautiful uh, uh, properties of this scalar metric. And I say here, Nick Manton and his school, the school meaning many people in particular, uh, Nuno and Martin and, and, uh, 
uh, Phil uh, and others. And, <clears throat> and there is indeed already a case that I find, as Martin was saying, you know, very interesting, which is the case of the Riemann surface being P1, where the uh, symmetric product is Pn. And so we are talking about metrics on projective space that have, you know, very interesting properties and that uh, somehow reflect the geodesics reflect the dynamics of whatever um, of this kind of theory. But I leave this for my colleague lecturers. And uh, so I want to explain the another proof of this. You see, I am a lazy analyst, and uh, um, I always try to reduce the problem to some other problem in which some people have dirt their hands in doing the analysis. And this is exactly what I am doing here. In the direct proof, I couldn't you know, do that, so I, I have to do some analysis. But in this approach, in this approach, um, this is exactly the strategy, uh, reducing the uh, vortex equations to other equations that have already been studied. And let me explain that. So for that, I consider now M to be a compact Kähler manifold uh, of arbitrary dimension. We'll be actually interested in the case in which this is complex dimension two, but for the moment it could be any dimension. And so again, I may just normalize the volume conveniently to express things. And then here, I don't consider a line bundle, but generally I consider a holomorphic vector bundle over M. In our case, we'll be interested in the case of rank two. Right? So this will be a complex surface. So complex dimension two in the application that I will give, and this will have rank two, but this, what I'm saying is totally general. And so the, the hermitian young mills equations for, uh, I will focus, instead of looking at the equations for a connection uh, and so on. I, uh, and so instead of, you know, fixing, um, uh, <clears throat> a smooth bundle and looking for a connection, or, or let's put it this way, instead of fixing a Hermitian C infinity vector bundle and looking for a connection, I fix the connection or equivalent the holomorphic structure and I look for the metric. So this is a different way, convenient way of looking, in fact, to the vortex equations as well as this uh, Hermitian Young Mills, sometimes called Hermitian Einstein equations. This is an equation for a Hermitian metric. H on E, that uh, is taking the contraction of the curvature. Now, now notice in this situation, let's just put all this in here, the curvature is no longer a function. It takes values in the skew Hermitian endomorphisms of the bundle E with respect to this metric. And uh, it's a two form with values in, in here. And, uh, and uh, so is the curvature, this is the curvature of the unique connection which is compatible with the uh, Hermitian metric, so it's a unitary connection, and with a complex structure in the sense that the zero one part of the connection gives me the Dolbo operator of the holomorphic structure. And then contracting with the Kähler form now gives me simply a section of uh, this uh, bundle of uh, Lie algebras, actually. This is basically the Lie algebra of UN, right? And, uh, and so then, um, so then now uh, taking traces in these equations, again, by Chen Wei theory, I can, uh, I can um, link the degree of this bundle to a uh, degree of this bundle to uh, first gen class. But now you see important, we are in higher dimensions and in order to make sense of degree, we have to take, you know, on a, on a Riemann surface, which is just a first gen class and you, uh, you know, a representative at Jew integrate. But here, because N is bigger than one, then you need to uh, confront the first gen class or a representative to the Kähler form uh, to the power N minus one. And this defines you a number which depends on the Kähler form. This is very important, right? And with that number, that depends on the Kähler form, 
you can define the slope, which also depends on the Keller form. I didn't want to be heavy here, but this, uh, what is called the slope, which is the degree of the bundle divided by rank here, depends also on this omega m, on the exactly the, the, the Keller form that you have here. Okay. No, if this equation is very important, because if n is equal to one, this is, uh, so if you're on a Riemann surface, this is the condition of being flat or predictably flat. And uh, if we are in n equals two, that is actually the situation we'll be interested. This is equivalent to the anti cell dual uh, condition on a four Riemannian manifold, what we call an instant one, right? And so the important theorem of Donaldson, Uhlenbeck, Yao um, says precisely that um, in order to, to uh, phrase the theorem, I have to now introduce an algebraic condition on a holomorphic bundle, which is that the slope of every coherent subsheaf of the bundle has to be smaller, so this is, this is a stability, than the slope of E. Now, don't be scared by coherent subsheaves. A coherent uh, subsheaf is actually uh, outside of some, uh, some um, sub variety of high uh, necessary uh, certain codimension is really a vector bundle. In fact, in the case of surfaces that we are interested, when n is equal to two, you can actually take E prime to be a vector bundle, but not necessarily a sub bundle. It's a vector bundle, so it's locally free, as itself is a vector bundle, but the inclusion here is not a sub bundle inclusion, right? But it is just nice to, you know, if you are in n equals two, the condition is that if you give me E and you have uh, a vector bundle for any, Bundle prime that defines a sub sheaf, right? That so outside of just some points, actually is uh, is actually a sub bundle, right? Then you have uh, that numerical condition and polystability, which is that E is a direct sum of vector bundles, each of which is stable and all of them having the same slope, the number that we defined previously, right? So the <clears throat> Don Solul and Beck Yao theorem says that the existence of solutions to the Young Mills Higgs, uh, Young, excuse me, the Hermitian Young Mills equations on E is equivalent to E being polystable. And in fact, if the solution is irreducible, then the bundle, the vector bundle is actually stable. So this is what is actually referred as Hitching Kobayashi correspondence. I mean, the name Hitching Kobayashi correspondence. Has been, has been used as a general term for this kind of correspondence. But the message I want to convey is that this was the name of Hitching Kobayashi correspondence was originally given exactly to this situation. And the vortex uh, theorem is actually a consequence of the Hitching Kobayashi correspondence, not just a similar thing. It is a similar thing, but is actually a consequence of the mm, Hitching Kobayashi correspondence proper, right? And um, let's see. Um, okay. So this theorem just let me say that when n is equal to one, so on Riemann surfaces, this is the theorem of Simon and Sashadri that was reproved by Donaldson precisely in this context of connections. Now, Simon and Sashadri were linking the stability of vector bundles to representations of the fundamental group, but those are you know, can be viewed as flat connections. And this is the point of view that Donaldson uh, adopted is the point of view of Atiyah and Bott and that uh, started considering these moment map equations. And so now I want to make the point that um, when dimension of M is bigger than one, yeah, I'm running out of time, right? Yes, let, let, let me see, I will be wrapping up. Yeah, I will be wrapping up. Uh, and leave it in a reasonable point, hopefully, hopefully. So the, the, when dimension um, of M is bigger than one, both e the equations and the stability depend on the Keller form. This is what I, I want to emphasize that. And uh, so I think maybe this is a good point to stop because, okay, this is the Donaldson, Uhlenbeck and Yao theorem, the Hitching Kobayashi correspondence. And I will show you tomorrow, not tomorrow, on Wednesday, uh, that indeed the, the, uh, that 
the theorem that for vortices, the external vortices, is a consequence of this theorem applied to a very particular rank two vector bundle that one can construct with the line bundle L and the section on the product of the Riemann surface by the sphere, right? Now, the, the thing is that on that setup, we have to consider this kind of correspondence, but only for solutions that are invariant under the action and the rotations in the sphere. This is the dimensional reduction procedure. Many equations that involve Higgs field naturally appear from this point of view are really dimensional reductions of just equations that involve connections. And the appearance of the Higgs field is because of the invariant under the action of a group that acts on the base manifold and can be lifted to the bundle. And so this is the, some, um, I mean, what one can refer as dimensional reduction. And this is what I will, I will, I will try to show in the next, in the next lecture. Okay, so let's thank Oscar. Yeah. So we have